Amen. It's good to see everybody. Uh, the Lord is good. I do have one more announcement that I wanted to share myself. If you guys could uh, be praying. Does this look lower than it normally is? Anyway. Oh, maybe I got, I got taller heels on today. So the Lord is good. Let me get back to my point. So <laughs> we, we are going to be asking you guys to be praying for uh, Pastor Earl and Renee. Uh, you know, we are One Church, Two Locations. They are taking their first ever sabbatical So in the month of July. So our church uh, board just approved a sabbatical policy that our full-time pastors, every a- after two years of uh, working full-time in the, in the ministry, they get one month sabbatical. That's not their vacation time, but that's a time to be refreshed, rejuvenated, and to come back uh, stronger with fresh vision. And so this is a move that is happening. We see, um, I'm, I consider myself a friend of pastors. I love pastors. Uh, one of the reasons I'm continuing my study in education is because I believe there's a lot of pastors that need support. And something that we have seen from the top, which is the Assembly of God, what we're a part of, is they're really pushing sabbaticals in, with their pastors because the last 10 years, we've seen more and more pastors leave the ministry after serving because it's a very easy to get burnout when you're, when you're pouring into people. And, of course, you got the devil after you, like, at all times. <laughs> Not that all, all Christians do, but when you're on the forefront, even more so. And so uh, we do have a question and answer sheet that uh, I forgot to bring to this campus. But if you have questions about sabbaticals, I would love to sit down and talk to you. I've actually just uh, written a paper and a speech about it for some of my classes because I I am very passionate to see pastors be healthy. And if they're not feeling themselves and resting, this is Earl Renee's first break uh, since forever. And he he definitely went kicking and screaming at, uh, at first. But the last meeting we had this week, he's actually looking forward to his break, and uh, it's going to be good because rest is biblical, and uh, sabbaticals are biblical too, and it's, it's, it's God's idea that, that we're implementing. And I also believe for all of us as, as people of God, we have to make sure that we are resting in him. We're in this series right now called uh, SWAT, which is Spiritual Warfare and Tactics. And we're probably going to continue it just a couple of weeks. We just didn't, you know, we had Father's Day, we had Kimber Rain, we just didn't get all of warfare. You have to have rest. After Elijah defeated the 450 prophets of Baal, his greatest attack came and he wasn't ready for it. And God prescribed rest to him. And so, you know, there's so much I can say about that. But I just want you guys to be praying for uh, Pastor Earl and Renee and that they that they receive rest and that they come back and uh, refresh. With, with that, we do have a team at our Southfield campus that's going to be helping. Pastor Josh is going to be helping a lot more on, on uh, Wednesday nights with the kitchen, and we are giving our midweek at the Southfield campus a break uh, during the month of July. So we won't have kids' church. We won't have youth group. We, uh, we won't have, uh, you know, Bible study. And that's also to give our volunteers a rest as well. So, you know, people like Jeremy who work full-time and then, you know, probably putting our 20 hours into the church, they also need rest. And so it's something that we're still learning and growing in, but this is a good thing. Amen? Okay, so I'm, I, I want to pray again. There, there's a heaviness that is not just in, in here. Young, young adults, you did a great job. You guys, who worship was amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And so the heaviness that I'm sensing is not, I, I don't believe it's because we necessarily, you know, carried it, it, it in with us. But there's a heaviness among our nation right now. Um, and those, peop- those of us who carry the spirit of God with us, God has given us spiritual gifts. And one of those gifts is called discernment. And so you may be discerning a heaviness. Some people, you know, may not even want to come to church this morning because of just the, the heaviness of it all. And, and often when we feel that kind of heaviness, we, we like to isolate ourselves, we, you know, because it's just like, oh, I don't want to deal with people, you know. And, and we just have to understand the ploys and the tricks of the enemy. This is the time the church needs one another even more. And I'm going to get more into some of the things that's going on um, in our nation, but I want to talk broad, and then I'm going to go more narrow. So I need you to stay with me, okay? So broad and then narrow. I'm going to talk about spiritual warfare today, and this is, this is spiritual warfare 101. Uh, spiritual warfare is something <laughs> that Josh and I have 
encountered our entire lives uh, of, of ministry. When we were first married, I'm going to open with this story. When we were first married, some of you guys have heard this before, but when we were first married, we lived in a little tiny apartment. It was smaller. The whole apartment was smaller than, than this room. And uh, we would pray and intercede. It was, it was such a great foundational time in our young adult years where other people were getting in trouble, young adults getting in trouble, living up their 20s. We were, we were getting in trouble living up our 20s for Jesus. And when I say getting in trouble, we had some of our young adults arrested because we were witnessing uh, outside of bars, and they said we were loitering. And we had, uh, we had people manifesting demons, like, on the constant. We, instead of breaking into places, we had keys because one of our friends was the intern and we would break into the church with our keys uh, at late in the midnight hour to pray and to intercede. Worshiping God was fun. And I want to say this to the young people today. What I, what I am concerned for young people and the fact that our community has become so online that we don't have true community anymore. And, and I believe that, that Online is a, is a tool that can be used positively. I even have Snapchat. A lot of people are Snapchat's the devil. If you use it for the devil, it's the devil. I, uh, I should have Jonas come up here and give my impersonation, his impersonation of me on Snapchat. Come on, Jonas. You ready for it? Come on, Jonas. You want to do it. Jonas, Jonas. Don't act like you're not shy, Jonas. Come on. Come on, Jonas. You can't leave. I'll buy you something extra afterwards. No, you're not going to do it. You did it for everybody yesterday. You're not going to do your impersonation of me. Oh, it was so good. Okay. All right. This is, this is the kid that hopped out. Okay, here he comes. I'm like, this is the kid who hopped out of the car yesterday, jumped a fence to save us a spot at, at Cedar Point. Come on. You are not shy. <laughs> it was awesome. What's, what's your impersonation of Auntie Joy on Snapchat? Let's hear it. All right. So she goes on. She, like, turns into Shrek or some green being. And she's like, hello, y'all. We should go to the church tomorrow come to the service and do not uh be late or something like that i don't know yes he killed it he killed it and i'm having him do that impersonation because he had me laughing so hard when he did it because anything can be a tool for righteousness if you use it right okay it could also be a tool for the enemy if we don't use it right and if we uh, allow it to use us if I if if you will if you allow it to, to lead you into to bad things and so saying all that to say this that for young people our circle of friends truly matter truly matter and it's we live in a generation that that uh, of young uh, of everybody where to keep peace we learn to appease and not have difficult conversations and the church to keep peace has learned to appease and not have difficult conversations. Now, I believe the difficult conversation needs to first start between you and the Lord, and it needs to start in a place of prayer. And so we're going to talk about spiritual warfare, and then we're going to come back to this, okay? So pause that. Here we go. A spiritual warfare. I'm going to open in, in Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Okay. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of the Lord so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggles is not against flesh and blood. Say flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against what? Flesh and blood. But against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In the what realms? heavenly realms therefore put on your full armor of god so that when the day of evil comes and it will and it does and and it comes often you may able you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand so back to the apartment we we lived in this apartment and there was a, there was a day um we were doing a lot of spiritual warfare in that season a lot of intercessory prayer a lot of street witnessing and we went to bed and and I woke up, and there was a manifestation. Uh, it was not a vision. It was not a dream. I was fully awake, and God opened my eyes to see a, a demonic being that was floating, if you will, like over me. Like, if I was a, a worldly person, I probably would have thought it was an alien or something. I mean, honestly, that's what I would have probably thought. It was buzzing, which is interesting because the Bible talks about uh, the Be Beelzebub and the prince of demons. And so it was interesting to me that it was buzzing, but it was buzzing. And at first I couldn't hardly even open my mouth, but I kept, I called on the name of Jesus in my, in my mind first. And then once I was able to 
fix my mind on Jesus, my mouth was open, and I said, get out in Jesus' name. You got to go in Jesus' name with authority. And that thing left um, that apartment. It's the only time I physically have seen um, a demon, but I have physically seen manifestations multiple times on people. And I believe we're living in an age that deception is so relevant and so rampant, like you said, it's everywhere. And we have to put on the full armor of God and we have to understand spiritual warfare or we will be led astray. One time uh, at the South Toledo campus, when it was solid rock, we were praying late into late into the night. And there was a young person, a youth that was manifesting um, a d demonic stronghold in his life. And we were casting this, we were trying, attempting to cast this demon out of this young man. And uh, it was a fight like I've never seen before. And Pastor Keith came to me and he mentioned this to me. And, and I have been thinking a lot about this lately because of the generation, everything that's going on. But he said, the, the demonic strongholds that is coming against this next generation are going to be so strong that unless you have the spirit of God, you will not be able, even the church, even the Christian saints will not be able to stand against it. And I, and I, I don't know why, like then, you know, when someone tells you something and you're young, you're just like, okay, yeah. But as now 25 years after that scene, I'm like, I, I, have, I have been a youth pastor with millennials, and now I'm, I have helped with Jeremy, with the youth, with, with Gen Z, and I see the deception increasing and the strongholds getting stronger, and not just with young people, but with the church. Our, the church in America has focused so much on outward fruit. That can be faked. You do realize that, right? Like success does not mean that there's true fruit. So we, have, we focus so much on leadership, which is a spiritual gift, but a lesser gift compared to the fivefold ministry. We focus so much on this and we focus um, so much on, on so many different things that we have forgotten to make true disciples, that discipleship is not just Sunday morning or a Bible study that happens at church. Discipleship is disciples making disciples doing life with one another. And so we have got to get back to the basics if we're going to do this. So this word today is getting back to the basics of spiritual warfare. Number one, spiritual warfare is real. That's why I opened with those, those stories of real life because so much of, so many of us in the church want to say it's, it's not real. Spiritual warfare is real. It's absolutely real. There's a picture I want you to put up there right here. The Christian life is not a playground. It's a battleground. But we want to be entertained and we want to be comfort, comfortable. And I, I, the Holy Spirit does want to bring comfort. Okay. But we have to realize that, that it is a battleground. Now, in the fact that we know that it is a battleground, does that mean that we go and we let everybody know how they're going to hell? No. Gener study church history. That has not worked in, in previous generations. It's not going to work now. It means we need to go sometimes undercover and, and, and let our light shine and build relationships with people and share the truth of Jesus. We have to spend time praying and interceding. Spiritual warfare is real. It is a battleground. The book of Ephesians is jam-packed with theological and practical truth, yet Paul says the best for the end. Paul concludes with the book of Ephesians with finally, finally, basically he's saying in conclusion, I have saved the most important issue of this epistle until the end of the letter. So you will remember nothing else I said. You will remember this. I want you to stand firm. I want this to stand out in your mind. Be strong in the Lord. That word strong, it, it comes from the Greek word uh, that means in, in do, in do nemo, which is where we get the word dunamis from, also a Greek word, and it is explosive strength, ability, and power. It's where we get the word dynamite from. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. It's the same word that's used in the book of Acts in chapter 1, verse 8. Our strength, though, friend, is not found in our intellect. It is not found in, in anything other than the Lord. Strong dynamite power in Jesus. When we try to be strong, not being in Jesus, then we mess up. 
Jesus needs to be our realm of existence and our place of habitation. We, which leads me to my second point. Not only is spiritual warfare real, get that in your head, it is real. And guess what? We are living in it. We are experiencing it right now. It is real. And it's getting intense. Not only is it real, but it has a residence. Say residence. We must understand spiritual warfare mostly resides in the mind. In the mind. There's no doubt that the mind is the strategic resonance where the battle is either won or lost. This is why we need to be dressed head to toe in the full armor of God. We need our mind. The helmet of salvation has to protect our thoughts. The Bible says to have the mind of Christ. Your opinion really doesn't matter. It is the opinion of God, the mindset of God that matters. But the way you state your opinion, it does matter. It needs to be with grace. It needs to be with love. We have to have the truth, but we have to have grace and love with that. Amen? And that's why we need, we need Christ because our flesh does not know how to share the truth. <laughs> our flesh doesn't know how to share the truth. I, I, hold up. Y'all, some of y'all ain't getting that revelation. Our flesh does not know how to share. If you listen, I'm going to be real for you for a minute. So when this, and I want to get more into it in, in, in a moment, but in recent news, most of you guys, everybody is talking about young people. Everyone's talking about how Roe versus Wade has been overturned. And of course, there's all kinds of false narratives, which I'm going to get into in a minute, that's out there. And it's just the, the, th the amount of things that people are saying that are, are not true are, are insane. And I was reading, I hardly ever get on social media. I, nowadays, I used to, I used to love social media. I, I, I don't have no time. 30 hours of school plus work plus four kids. There's no time for that. But I decided instead of finishing up the paper I needed to write, I was going to take a little break and get on social media. Big mistake. I'm texting my husband like, I just want to tell this person about themselves so bad. I mean, what's wrong with these people? And they're, you call yourself a Christian, this and that. And I'm just like, I need to calm myself down. My daughter came in. She's like, mom, let's go do this. And tomorrow, and let's go to, I'm like, I'm mad. Get out. I'm, well, she's like, get off of Facebook. <laughs> I'm like, it was like the Lord speaking right through her. I'm like, yeah, I need to get off Facebook because, because if I put some kind of quick, not really thinking through opinion and just telling somebody about themselves, what good is that going to do? I've never seen anyone won over with that. Now, I'm not saying I, I would never tell you you're a grown person or, or, or even you have to come to a decision of what you're going to post and how you're going to share things. That's up to you. I'm not talking about anyone in this room. Don't get in, you know, thinking about anything like that. OK, what I'm saying is that our mind has to be fixed on the Lord because if we know the truth, but yet we speak the truth in a way that is condescending and demonic, we're going to lose. We're going to lose. And so we have to be careful to share the truth with right things. And however, it starts in our relationships. There's a lot of, I want to talk about the number one weapon of the enemy. Do you know what the number one weapon of the enemy is? It's lies and deception. Is it up there already? Oh, <laughs> the number one. Yeah, I was like, man, that was just like too quick. You even knew the deception part too. I was like, okay, yeah, lies and deception. So right now it was, it was interesting because I had, you know, Kimber stay with us for a week and I love when she comes because she just walks in the spirit of God too. And it, it's just, it, it, she's like one of my favorite people, but she was talking a lot um, about false narratives and she has such a huge world view on things too. And so she was talking about false narratives and I was like, the Lord was revealing to me some false narratives that I was believing myself. It was personal things that I don't believe was necessarily affecting anyone other than myself at the time, but it could have if I, if I allowed myself to think on it too long, right, and meditate. We have to be careful with ruminating thoughts, right, when we're always constantly thinking. The Bible even tells us instead to think on things that are good, things that are lovely, things that are heavenly, things that are of the Lord, but when we allow our mind to ruminate on other things of this person offended me, this, this person was rude, uh, and, and then entertaining lies of the enemy of how we're not good enough, how we're not qualified, blah, 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 we, we can give in to, to a false narrative. Well, there's a lot of false narratives right now that's going, going out. One of the things that, that I 
that has bothered me that is not true, that we have to be careful how to share the truth, is this false narrative of pro-life people don't adopt, they don't help with the poor, they don't help with foster care. And so this is like this huge false narrative where, where, where the people that I know that help the most with, with the poor people I know. I have a pastor friend um, that they've raised four children. She she work, the, the wife work, works in business. He's a pastor. And, and they've just like fostered f- like four kids that they're just adopting on top of already raising kids. Our church, um, including our inner city campus, just raised, I can't remember how many thousands of dollars to give to foster care last year. I myself have had single pregnant teenage women live with me for a season and to help them through one of the hardest times of their life because they had no place to live while they were pregnant. And then even after the baby was born for, for months, lived with us. So, and that's just, and I'm not saying that to boo boo, look at joy or whatever. I'm saying, I believe we all do our part and we all should continue to do our part because Whatever happens, we're, the job is going to be even more. I don't want us to revert to, I want us to understand the difference between holiness and legalism. I do not want to see the deception and the false narratives of going back to legalism where we start becoming so nasty to people that I, I remember as a young, young adult and even as a teenager, like um, someone that I respected who was raised in a godly home who had a child outside of wedlock. And the response that this person received from the church is sad. Treat it like crap. But yet we're pro-life and and this person was treated like crap. I believe the church has come further than that in the time that we live today. And so we need to make sure we're loving people, we're treating people right, we're treating people with kindness, and yet we're still sharing the truth. And that that we're showing with our life that we don't live that false narrative. We do believe in adoption. We do believe in uh, helping with foster care. We do believe in uh, taking care of the poor because that's what God tells us to do. But we also believe that life starts with conception because that's what we see in the word of God when he says in Jeremiah that I know them in the womb. And yet we still believe in grace and forgiveness for those who who, who have made mistakes. We have many people in our congregation who who we want to care for and love that that have made mistakes just like any mistake because really honestly it goes back to being obedient to the Lord. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. And guess what? All of us sin and fall short. And so we all need grace. And when we remember our darkest, worst moment, (laughs) the time that maybe the Bible said for me in my rebellion, the the Old Testament scripture said that for a, a child to be the kind of rebellion that I was, I should have been taken outside of the camp and beat to death. Thank God for Jesus that he he stood in that gap. Right. And so for me, when I want to look like, oh, I think I'm better than somebody. I remember where I came from. And even if it's, if you're worse than his judgment, the Bible says, man, take that plank out your own eye. Right. So remember where we came from so that we can walk in love because it all starts in the mind. And d- d- sin is deceitful, friends. It's deceitful. Do you realize that people oftentimes they just they don't think they're doing anything wrong. They're in deception. Does that mean that us being the light, like, like what Kimber said a couple weeks ago, we want to make sure that, that we have this, um, approach to being with people that we're not so much only with people who, who don't know Jesus that, oh, I don't need the church anymore. I feel more comfortable with the world and I'm, I'm just going to be over here, uh, you know, being a light and being a witness, but not, not wrestling through our issues with people who are of like mind who love the Lord. Okay. But we don't want to be so much. I'm only going to be in the church that I'm afraid to be a light to people who don't know Jesus. Right. We have to have, we have to have that balance again, which is why who our circle matters, who we find, who builds us up, who loves on us. We have to come back to the truth that the enemy's only weapon is lies and deception. And we have to dismantle false narratives. And I believe it starts first by dismantling in our own homes, having honest conversations, not beating up a child who has a different opinion than you or who doesn't understand something. Let them, let them express what they think and be okay with it. Okay. This is what, okay. Well, let me share this and then let them share what they're saying. Cause they're going to have, they're going to have conversations with their peers. They're going to have 
um, false narratives that are going to be brought to them that we have to help dismantle in a loving way. First, our 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, In order that Satan may not outwit us, for we are not uh, unaware of his schemes. We have to understand the schemes of the enemies. Friends, don't fall victims to the lies and deception of the enemy. Guard your mind. Do this by keeping your mind on Christ. We've got to guard our mind. How we guard our mind is so important. We should be guarding our mind by what we're watching, what we're listening to, uh, who we surround ourselves with, making sure we're in our word. Guard your mind. If you can't sleep at night, a lot of times people say, oh, I can't sleep at night. I'm having a hard time. And that's when the ruminating thoughts, man, there's awesome things out there. There's Christian meditation apps that can help you sleep at night. Anoint you, like go old school Pentecostal, anoint your pillow with oil, you know, get the good smelling kind. I don't care. Just do what you pray until you fall asleep, <laughs> you know, I, come on. Okay. Let me, let me go. There's so much more that I want to say. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this scripture here for the weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world. They're not what? Weapons of the world. This is 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. There's strongholds in people's minds, lies that people and young people believe. And to demolish them, we have to make sure that we're fighting the way God has called us to fight. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. So we have to take our own thoughts captive. Rather than falling victim to the devil's attacks, we have to make this mental decision to seize every thought that tries to pull us away from God. Amen? Oh, so much more. I, I mean, honestly, this could be like just this message could be six weeks long, and so let me try to move on. So 101, I don't got time for 201 today. We're just doing 101. Spiritual warfare is what? It's real. It has a resonance. Number three, spiritual warfare has a real rival. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Oftentimes we feel like flesh and blood is our rival. We're going to, what, what we did wrong when we learned deliverance in the late nineties, early two thousands is we did not take in consideration. I'm, t I'm not saying everybody, I'm saying we those of us who are around us in the young adult years who are now all middle-aged people, okay? What we did wrong in that time, looking back, is we were so passionate and so focused on, on deliverance that, like the disciples, we rejoiced that demons submitted and obeyed, and we did not take time to really help people, counsel through people, because not only did they have strongholds in their minds, but they had, they had to retrain the way they thought. And sometimes there were some issues there that they really needed some Christian counseling with as well, that we were young and didn't know any better. And if I go back, that's one of the only things early on when you become a pastor at 25, there's so much that I didn't know that I know now that I can't rewind. I can only move forward and, and do better now. Okay. And so, but does that, does that neglect, does that, does that mean that deliverance is not real? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that we need to follow the instructions of Christ and we need to, we need to do it the way he tells us to do it. And we need to remember that human beings, even ones who don't agree with us politically, who don't agree with us spiritually, who don't agree with us um, with the Bible, with our faith, doctrinally, human beings are created in God's image and should be treated with respect and love. Praise the Lord. So spiritual warfare has a real rival. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be alert and sober mind. Again, be alert and sober mind. Why does it say sober mind? Because we have to be able to think straight. <laughs> we have to be able to think straight. I just, I, I, I kind of gave you guys a little synopsis of the word that the Lord gave me for, for camp about Eutychus and how people are sleeping in the church. And my gosh, people are sleeping in the church. And there's so many distractions that are causing us to, to sleep and how we need to wake up where it says, do not be drunk on wine, but filled with the Holy Spirit. Because God wants us to be sober minded and, the, and that we can get this feeling from the Lord that we're trying to get from the world that it's going to leave us, it's going to leave us dry. We got to wake up. The church has got to wake up. And instead of saying, look at that person, like take time. There's some seasoned saints in this place. Take time to invest in a younger person. 
take time. Like we got a whole front row here, a back row there. I mean, we got some younger people that we can, we can invest in. Take time. Take them out. Say, hey, I'm going to get you coffee. Let's sit down and talk. Do that. You have wisdom that needs to be imparted. Don't wait for someone to invite you because they are socially awkward and they don't know how. I love you, though. I love you. I'm not talking about you personally. Just your generation. Just your generation, okay? 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 A little bit you, though. <laughs> they don't know how they don't know how they need to be taught guess what you know how your prefrontal lobe was developed before facebook ever came into existence you know how teach them but teach them in love because the enemy is after a generation because as we shared a, a few months ago maybe if it was in 2020 when we talked about that sin cycle Every generation, we are only one generation of being extinct as a Christian faith. If we are not passing our faith down to the next generation, we are only one generation away of being extinct in our country, in our country. So Lord, help us. The enemy is invisible, but guess what, friends? He is real. And the Bible says that he is the enemy that prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour looking for someone to devour. Now, years ago, one of my kids, I'm not going to say who, because I've come to, dis to discover as they are older, they don't like me using them as an example. So good thing about having four is y'all, you don't know for sure who, but one of the four, um, years and years ago, years and years ago, led some people to the Lord in the neighborhood. And they were explaining who Jesus was, and, and the, the kids in the neighborhood knew Jesus. But then they started to explain about how we have to guard our hearts, our minds, and our eyes, and all this stuff because the devil is real too. And they had no idea that the devil was real and that Satan is real. This was this, and this wasn't that long ago. I mean, it was years and years ago, but not that long ago, you know what I mean? So <laughs> this is the thing the enemy is real, and he is coming after. The people of God. And the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but spiritual forces of evil. But can I say this? I feel like the church has just stopped at we wrestle not. We're not interceding and praying. So at camp, my favorite part of camp, we all have different parts, was when I honestly didn't think we were going to even give an altar call at camp. We were just going to do, when I, when I preached about the Utica thing, that we were just going to have, um, I, I felt like it was just already so heavy and good, and that, that was good enough. Worship was great. And, but then some people, they just wanted it more. So you're going to give people what they, <laughs> what they want. So uh, and God is going to give you, he's going to meet you at your level of expectation. Does that make sense? And so anyway, kids broke out an intercessory prayer where they were praying and interceding. I want us to learn that we don't, that intercessory prayer is not just when the spirit of God comes on us in, in that sense, it, but we have to make a decision to intercede and pray. And you're not going to always feel like it. As a matter of fact, most of the time you're not going to feel like praying. I wore my prayer scarf today. I know it doesn't match my outfit, but I wore my, pr well, you know, I guess Olive is the new neutral. But anyway, <laughs> I wore it today because I woke, I went to bed feeling heavy. And I was praying. I woke up feeling heavy. And there's so many distractions. It's so much easier just to get on Facebook and be critical. Or I, I'm talking to, the, to our, 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 the older folks, Facebook. It's so much easier for younger people just to get on TikTok and be critical of everybody than to actually pray for people. But guess what? Our criticalness is not going to change them. Intercessory prayer will. There's a quote, I forget the guy's name. I think it's like Walter Wink, maybe. I might be messing it up. But he says, intercessory, our history belongs to the intercessors. And I've always wondered what that quote really meant. But I was in shock on, on what was happening in our, in our country because I've never, never in my life at 43 years old thought I would see it in my lifetime. But history belongs to the intercessors. And we got to still pray if we want people to turn back to God we've got to pray we've got to intercede because the enemy is attacking he is attacking he is attacking churches he's attacking Christians he is trying to give this false narrative to the to the world that we're a bunch of hypocrites a bunch of idiots and we have got to pray we've got to pray 
We've got to know the, who the real enemy is, amen? And we've got to wrestle in prayer, in prayer. We've got to wrestle in prayer, okay? Now, I saved my favorite point for today for the last one because I could be there more. I got so much more that I'm skipping, but this is just 101, not 201. So this last thing, so first, spiritual warfare is real. Spiritual warfare has a real residence, and then spiritual warfare has a real rival, the enemy, the devil, and one-third of the angels that were fallen who are demonic beings and spiritual and, and demonic beings who, who, who the spiritual uh, forces of evil in the heavenly realms is real, and it is a real rival that we have to be understanding that that attack on your life probably has more to do with what you're going to do in the future than what you've done in the past, and we got to be ready. Number four. Spiritual warfare is one and the final round. This is where we mess up. We give up too soon. We give up too soon. The, and the Bible talks about it. people who receive Christ with joy and they spring up real quick. But because they don't allow their roots to go down deep, they, 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 the, the cares of the world, it comes and it, and, it, and it strips them away. When we read about the parable of the sower and the seed, okay, of course, the, the sower uh, representing uh, the, the church going out and sharing the good news and the seed representing the gospel, right? That, that when, that's only one in four that actually receive and produce fruit. One in four. That's statistics. And we want more, more, more for everything. But when we read the Bible, he says, narrow is the way. How many find it? A whole bunch? Few. This is Jesus. And so we've got to make sure, man, I, I hope we're getting this today. So spiritual warfare is one in the final round. Uh, Matthew 24, 13 says, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. To the end. Ain't that right? To the end. I, and doing this, again, I, there's people who've been doing it for 50 plus years. But even just in the 25 years that I've been uh, a leader and ministering and pouring into people. I've seen people get knocked out in the final round. And you're like, you're just praying, God, bring them back. Because I believe you can fall down and get knocked down and get back up again. But also, I believe that you can choose to walk away. Luke 4, 13 says, when the devil had finished all the tempting, he left until an opportune time. So here's Jesus. He just got baptized and water, and he's led into the desert for a, a time of testing and temptation. And the Bible says that the enemy left after that, for, but not for good, but for another opportune time. And so I want to talk to you today about different opportune times that the enemy comes after you. I'm going to hit these real quick because he wants to knock you out in the final round right here, and we got to stand firm. But we have to be aware of his schemes, okay, and his tricks. Number one, immediately after a great victory— Every time you have a great victory, immediately, sometimes it's during. I'm going to tell you, we, we want to sit there and talk about how awesome camp was. It was awesome. But at the same time people were interceding, there was kids that was ready to fight and kids that were ready to leave camp. And I'm telling you, uh, yes, I'm telling you, I was like, the paradox. I was just like, very, wow. And, and I was kind of discouraged by it. And I talked to my best friend. She said, would it have been a good camp? If you didn't have the paradox of, of God touching people and the enemy, you know, showing up at the same time, that just shows that the camp was really good. I was like, okay, thank you for helping my perspective. <laughs> but this is the thing, immediately after a great victory. That's why most pastors, they hate Monday mornings. Because <laughs> so, immediately after God moves, it's so easy. To, 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 to fall victim to a, an attack of the enemy. Now, and that's why we see over and over working in youth ministry for 20 plus years is kids will go to camp, have an awesome experience, and then immediately after they, they get back from that experience, like will fall and, and backslide and do something really stupid because the enemy is right there wait, waiting for it. So you got to be careful. Opportune time number two. Say number two. two. Immediately before a great victory. <laughs> Right before you're going to go do something awesome, you have it in your mind, you're going to share the gospel with somebody, boy, the enemy is going to come, attack, attack, attack. Uh, before a milestone in your life, attacks come. You know, getting ready to celebrate 30 years of marriage. Oh, best believe on year 29, the last six months, the enemy's coming attacking. Okay, that's how he does. Oh, I've been free from alcohol for, for three years. Guess what? Uh, year two, on the ninth month, he's coming attacking. 
right before that milestone. Be careful. Number three, opportune time number three. When we are emotionally, mentally, and physically drained, what did I tell you about rest? Rest and spiritual warfare go together. Because halt temptation, you know, I love me a good acronym. Never be too angry. Never be too, wait, I can't, I am dyslexic though, so I will mess it up. Never be too hungry. Yeah. Yeah. Never be too angry. Never be too lonely. And never be too tired. Some of us never be too hot. (laughs) Just learn. (laughs) <laughs> but saying all this to say that we have to regulate our emotions we have to to be spiritually mature you have to be emotionally mature Pete Scazzaro I'm so glad for his teachings he says you cannot be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature you cannot say you are a spiritually mature Christian when the moment your emotions rise in any kind of level you just have to give in to your flesh and listen it's taken me years, and everyone, I still sometimes mess up. And so you have to regulate that emotions. Sometimes those of us who feel a little bit more, is there anyone else in, in the house that feels a little bit more? Like, we, we don't have the laid-back gene. Come on, someone besides me. We, we don't have the just chill, all the, just the laid-back. We, we just feel things a little bit more than normal people feel things. Though I want to talk to my people for a minute, okay? Your feelings are not facts. Thank you. They ain't ready for it. Your feelings are not facts. They are feelings. Does that mean that your feelings are not real? No. Your feelings are real. They are real. And so what I've been trying to do, and even my conversations with all my extra feelings that even that I sometimes have, and now they're even extra, extra middle-aged joy, it's terrible. <laughs> it's already extra. Then it's like extra, extra. It's to express, when I have to express my feelings, say to my husband or to one of my children, I try to say it like this. I'm not saying you did this to me. I'm saying I feel I feel like you don't love me at this time. That is not a fact. It is not true. It is a feeling. But let me express my feelings. Now, where I can, I do express it passionately uh, because I do everything passionately. (laughs) Well, it hasn't been as much him as uh, children here of late. But um, (laughs) my dad told me, okay, you guys are making me sidetrack. But anyway, my dad told me when we first got married, He said, you'll blame your mom and I for the first seven years of your marriage. Then after that, you'll blame your husband. You did not tell me. Then after you have teenagers, you will blame them. (laughs) You were just, oh, you were just learning. You still had some teenagers at home then. Okay. So, yes. But I realized I cannot blame my parents for my adult decisions. I cannot blame my husband for my adult decisions. And I cannot blame my teenagers for making me feel anxiety. I can only put the onus on myself. That's right. And so what we need to do sometimes is expose our feelings in a safe, right place with the right people of God and then not give them credit because they, they are real, but they are not facts because the enemy will lie to us. I told you guys, I mean, and I exposed this and since I exposed it, Thank you, Jesus. It's been better. But there was a a time that I woke up in the middle of the night, probably two months ago, and went to the bathroom like middle-aged women do in the middle of the night. And I'm sitting there, and and as clear as day, in my mind, I thought, why are you even back in school? Why are you even trying? You have never done anything right. You, you're, I mean, it was like, it was like, I was believing it. It was like, you, you don't know how to raise kids. You don't know how to plant churches. Why are you going back, back to school? And when I say it, I still feel the tears come up because it felt so real. But it was a lie of the devil. And guess what? I'm telling you, friends, I know I, I'm a little extra, so maybe I feel a little bit more than everybody else. But I guarantee that you probably have times that you feel like that. And whatever it is for you. That you're dealing with and it feels so real but it's not truth and so we have to be careful but guess what at that time I was exhausted obviously it was the middle of the night can't just hold it to the morning <laughs> I was exhausted <laughs> 
I was tired. I was drained, poured out. I had been working hard. And so, of course, the enemy was trying to calm. I was like, and then I got mad. And I talked to one of my, my spiritual friends, something else, the enemy. I, I had got free from this offense that I had towards somebody. Yeah, pastors get offended, too. I'm being all kinds of real today. Y'all feeling it? Y'all feeling it? All kinds of real. I was so offended at this person. I can only see my side. And I had got set free from this offense. And I was like free. And then all of a sudden, something happened. I was all offended again. And my friend said, how dare the devil try to bring that back on you and I was like you're right (laughs) how dare he I worked hard for that I went to counseling for that I got deliverance for that freedom how dare the devil like three months later try to bring that back on me we gotta call things out so we have to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. If we are not receiving the Lord, how can we give what we don't have? How can we pour out living waters when we are a dry and thirsty land inside of us? You got to make time. You got to get around people that will lift you up, but not depend on the people, depend on God because he brings different. Sometimes it's, I, I've just said, my friend, my friend, my friend, I've, I just have talked about three or four different people right now because it can't just be one person. All of this is too much for one person. (laughs) Are you the main one who told me that? Year one, you're like, babe, you need to go find a mentor. (laughs) Yeah. And this is, and for all of us, friends, that's why we need collective, the body of Christ. Collective, the whole body. Okay? So when we are emotionally, physically, and mentally drained, best believe the enemy is coming. Take care of yourself so that you can take care of the gospel that we hold dear to our hearts and share it with others. Opportune time number four, and I'm almost done. When we open the door for the enemy through disobedience. Oh, we don't want to talk about this one. Do not give the devil an opportunity. My kids, when they were little, they used to play this wrestling thing with my husband. My favorite thing about it is that he, he didn't always throw me to the ground to tickle me to death because I'm still at 40 something. I hate being tickled. I hate it. Especially the way Josh tickles. It's like stabbing, but it's funny and stabbing at the same time. It's terrible. But he, so then he took that over to the kids and they would run from him in our house. The way it it, it is, it's like, you kind of like go through the living room, then go through the dining room. There's a little back room back there and there's a little tiny bathroom and then the little kitchen and like walkway. And so sometimes they would get to the, the point where the little bathroom is And they would try to escape from my husband, and they would throw themselves in the bathroom. But Josh has size 13s. So he would put that foot right where they're closing the door into the door as they're trying to slam it so they don't get the tickle monster. And, well, usually they lost when that size 13 got in that door. That that is a silly analogy. But if we can think of that in in, in the setting of when we are trying to do right and we are trying to do good, but... We don't close the door all the way. We leave it cracked. Maybe we want a little breeze. Maybe, you know, for whatever reason, we leave a door just a, maybe in case we want to get out a little quicker. We leave that door cracked. That enemy will put his foot there and have a foothold. And once his foot's there, he will squeeze his way back in. And that happens through disobedience. If you know what is right and you deliberately choose to do wrong, that is disobedience. And that is the surest way to let the enemy have victory in your life. What open doors do you have? What open doors in your life have you had for the enemy? Are there things you're watching, things you're saying, things you're doing, people that, that what open doors do you have in your life that you know this is given the enemy? You wonder why you're dealing with anxiety and yet you're reading this and watching this and doing that. Whatever it is, you're, close those doors. Close those doors. Three keys real quick. I know it's like three, four, whatever. Real quick. Keys to lock and close every door of the enemy. Number one, prayer. Victory and spiritual warfare is inseparable from prayer. History belongs to the intercessors. This picture, show it real quick, please. Going into the prayer room. Look at those little little kitty cats, little kitty, kitty, kitties. I'm not a cat person. I wish we could find a picture like that with like a puppy and then like a wolf. But anyway, um, <laughs> going into the prayer room, coming out, coming out. 
Oh, man, my animal people are saying we're going to get her a kid in next. I already see it. <laughs> the Lord can grow my heart even more. Okay, coming into the prayer room, though, weak and defenseless, going out, powerful, powerful. I just saw this other video of this, this um, it was a lioness, and I love lioness. They're so awesome, and they, I love how they travel together, and boy, they're the hunters, and they go out. Anyway, it was this lioness, and it had a little cub, and there was, a big lion. I don't know what he was thinking he was going to do, but he was going to try to come over and like smack around the little cub. Boy, that lioness, rawr. And then Auntie Lioness next to her came and was like, no, nah, you ain't messing with our babies. And I thought, yes, Lord, let the women of God come together so that the enemy stops messing with our babies. Because he's trying to take out our babies and we've got to pray and intercede. And, and intercession is so powerful. And this is the thing. I want to give permission out loud right now. If you feel called to lead a prayer group in this church, you do not have to wait to Tuesday to do it. Like, pray. If you want to come up here, we will give you access. Pray. If you want to grab people together, pray. It changes things. Last but not, not least, obedience talked about that. That closes doors and authority. Take an authority over the enemy. Stand to your feet with me, will you? Jesus is good. And he is worthy. Jeremy, can you get on that guitar? Thank you. Let's just close our eyes. I want to take a moment right where we're at. And, and let's turn this place into a prayer house. Because the Bible says that his house should be a house of prayer. And let's begin to pray and intercede. Can we start praying for our nation? Can we start praying even now? God, would you just, would you just move? Move in our nation. Pray for revival. God, wake, awaken hearts again. Start in the church, Lord. There's people sleeping in the church. They're sleeping on you, God. Awaken their hearts. Bring them back to you. Turn their hearts to you, God. Help us learn to pray even when we don't feel like praying. Help us learn to pray. Help us learn to intercede.